So my request is, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, I want you to doubt everything I tell you and challenge it. Don't listen to a word that I have to say and accept it. I want you to check the references, check the quotes, check the statistics, because I could deceive you. I could come today, show a few like nice words by some non-Muslim academics and we're good. I make you feel good about your Islam. But I don't want that. I want you to have the intellectual rigor and the spiritual certainty that what you have is the truth. So if you don't ask the questions, who is going to give you the answers? So today, this isn't a lecture. It's not a class. You know, This is a conversation. When you hear something that you disagree with, you don't like or you don't, don't understand, if you're able, raise a hand. If you can't, just shout. I sh I'm sure that we'll hear you, okay? So we might ask the question, isn't Christianity irrelevant? Isn't the thing today secular liberalism and atheism? Why should I care what the Bible has to say as a Muslim? Or why should I as a Christian have to care what Muslims think about the Bible or my faith or my beliefs? Two things. The first is the majority of the academic organizations that write about the Quran and early Islam, 75% of the people there are not Muslim. So the primary research being done about the preservation, transmission, and teachings about the Quran are by non-Muslims in academic institutions. So a lot of the shubuhat, all of the doubts, the arguments created against Islam are in this academic bubble by a very few amount of people but who are dedicated to what I would argue being anti-Islam. One of these people attempted to do his PhD in London for something like 23 years. I see that brother Sadat is smiling. For 23 years, he tried to learn Arabic, Greek, Hebrew, Latin. He even used to go to a masjid in Ghana, and I could be wrong about the country, but he would dress as a Muslim he grew out his beard, and five times a day he went to the masjid so he could preach about the Messiah to Muslims. You might think I'm making this up, but some people here know the name of that individual. Eventually, he did get his PhD, but he had to go to Australia to a liberal arts university in what I presume was the middle of nowhere, and he specialized after 23 years of studying Islam and Christianity on the works of a uh, European uh, colonialist preacher that went to India. His name is Karl Fander. So can you imagine, you studied religion for 23 years and all you could produce is a thesis of 400 terribly written pages about the works of a missionary in India. That's it. So we have the strength and we have the knowledge and we should use it. So. Christianity is relevant for two reasons. The first is, many people are unfamiliar with this ayah in the Quran. As Muslims, we believe that the people of the book, primarily Christians, will come to understand who Isa ibn Maryam actually is before their death. Now, there's a difference of opinion on what this ayah means, but the general meaning should be that he is a cause for them to change their beliefs, and either in the throes of death, they come to realize who he is, that he's actually the Messiah and not God, or it is they will live and fight alongside him and come to know who he is and believe in the truth of Islam. So while today it may be the case that Muslims, sorry, that the majority of people are becoming secular liberals, it is not the case that this trend will always hold. And it tells us something that when it comes to the battles of Gog and Magog, the uh, Antichrist, the Dajjal, who will we align with? The Christians and the Ahadith mentioned this. So at some point, their religion will become relevant again. And at some point, there will be a Christian. I don't know who it is, sometime in the future, claiming victory and will raise the cross in the sight of the Muslims. So I go back in my mind to the battle of Uhud. We were winning that battle as Muslims. And then, just before we could conclude the battle, we gave up on the plan in search of the booty that was on the field. 
So I look at Muslims today telling us, don't focus on Christianity at all. Focus on secular liberalism and atheism, put all your resources in for that. And I have to say we're winning right now. Most people are leaving Christianity. We define our society as a post-Christian society. So we should be happy to like put all of our resources into the Dawa. When you think we buy a church and we convert it into a masjid, shouldn't we go to that community and give them Dawa? Because it's the people in that community that had the church, right? So is it relevant? Yes, it is. And the vast majority of polemics against Islam come from missionaries who are very convicted in their faith. And they will do almost anything to bring a Muslim into doubt. Now, my speciality is in manuscripts. I like things when they're written down, mostly because I have a terrible memory, as my brothers will let you know. But more importantly, it's not just paper and ink. I want you to think about what manuscripts are, because manuscripts are a telltale sign of where a civilization is in its, uh, in its developmental period. Just think about this. The Christians and the Jews were illiterate people who knew how to create manuscripts. Uh, papyri, which is like tissue paper almost, very fragmentary, parchment, animal skin, and they had something called a scriptorium, a dedicated house for writing. They had this for several hundred years before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. So for hundreds of years, they had the ability, the intellectual resources, the manufacturing capabilities to preserve their scripture, and they didn't. The early Muslims, who still had to figure out, and with all due respect, how to spell certain words, how to represent certain letters, we had to develop our orthography, we had to specialize in paleography. After the Battle of Badr, some of the mushrikeen were let go if they taught some of the Muslims how to read and write. This is how early we were starting with these things. So we had to figure out how to represent the Quran on something written, who would be the authoritative reciters, where we would send them, and we had to teach people how to transmit this knowledge. We were starting with zero infrastructure, and yet we still managed to preserve our scripture. Now we have to ask the question, why? Everything was against us. Put your hand up if you're familiar with the Battle of Yamama. Okay, that's cheating. Any, one sister, any other sister know that battle? Okay, no. All right, so the MSA has to do some uh, classes on early Muslim history. Okay, inshallah. The Battle of Yamama, many of the Hufas died. And so it became a wonder in the, in the heads of the companions if more of the Hufayz and the reciters, the Quran, they begin to die, who's going to transmit the Quran? Yes, they had belief in Allah's promise, in the Nahnu Nazana Dhikra, but in Allahu La Hafizun, indeed we have revealed the reminder and we will protect it. They had faith in that. But they also had to tie their camel, didn't they? So they sat down, not with one council, but two. And over a period of years, alhamdulillah, they managed to transmit the Quran to the point that today the academics call what they transmitted the Uthmanic Rasam, the writing of Uthman. I've had some non-Muslims come to me and say, you call it the writing of Uthman because he created the Quran, or that he developed the surahs in it. Has anyone heard that one before? Okay, that's cheating again, but that's fine. This is what they tell us, but the Uthmanic Rasam is when Uthman Wajidahu and, and the companions decided how to represent the recited Quran in a textual way. Just think about this. Whenever you look at writing on your screen or a piece of paper, someone at some time had to develop a convention and other people had to agree to it. How do you think the word son, as in a male child, would usually be spelt in the English language maybe 200 years ago? Anyone want to give it a guess? No? Yeah. Was it maybe S U N? S O okay. Maybe S O N N E or something. Okay, like you've that. seen this presentation before, so he's cheating, but yes, S O N N E. And there's a tradition, uh, I think it's in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, 
But the companions go to Uthman radiallahu an and they ask him about one word that I think occurs twice in the Quran, the word tabut. Anyone know that word? Well, I think it's only twice in the Quran. And they come to ask him, do we put it with a closed ha or do we do it with an open face ta? One letter's difference, am I correct? Yeah. One letter's difference. So you're going to the leader of the Muslim world to make sure that the Muslims either pronounce it tabut or taboo. Full stop. This is how particular and specific they were. So we could have faith that they actually took the steps to preserve what we recite today. And we're going to be looking at it, inshallah. So it's not just paper and ink. When you have animal skin, well, the animal can't survive without the skin, so you have to kill the animals. Typical, you need something like 30 sheep or a couple cows to get the animal skin from them. Then you need someone with the ability to prepare the skin so that it becomes a writing surface. Now, the majority of this knowledge was kept in Egypt because the Christians made that the writing center of the world at that time. So along the river, what's the river in Egypt? I forget the name. Nile. Nile, thank you, I'm an old man, forgive me. There were a couple of towns and cities which no longer exist, but in their garbage heaps, we continue to find manuscripts 2,000, 2,100, 2,300 years old. And we're able to compare them with statistics. So what we know is, subhanAllah, the Christian scribes in Egypt managed to preserve the Quran at a more accurate level than they did the Bible. That sounds strange, but there's a brilliant book by an academic, Dr. Brent Mungri. It's called God's Library. And they actually go through the data. The Muslims became the dominant force in Egypt in terms of the population in the 11th or the 12th century CE. So for a couple of hundred years, Christians were still the majority. And when we check what they copied in your own writing houses, they chose not to copy the New Testament. They copied the books that were outside of the New Testament, what the Christians called deuterocanonical works. So basically, Egyptian Christians are not like today's Christians who are evangelical. They chose to read books that say completely different things with completely like beliefs with odds with historical Christianity. And we know this because we have the manuscripts which still survive. So they tell us a story. Wouldn't it be strange if a thousand years from now, archaeologists come to some Muslim homes here in Guelph and they go into our homes and they don't find a single mushaf of the Quran. Wouldn't that be strange? Or all you find are writings of uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, right? They're going to start asking questions about us. So they did the same thing to those early Christians. And all of a sudden, it's not Christianity, it's Christianities, plural. So when you read the Quran and read it with a critical eye, eye I think it's uh, uh, Surah 3, Allah Imran, where it mentions that the full knowledge of Isa alayhi salam has been given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those who disagree with him are corruptors and liars. Now, we're not throwing pejoratives, but I want you to think about this. How much of the Quran do you think is dedicated to the life of Isa ibn Maryam? Not a great deal, it's not a biography, is it? But yet, it contains data that archaeologists and historians would agree with. Did he claim to be the Messiah? Yes. Was he from Bani Israel? Yes. Did people claim he did miracles? Yes. Isn't this the historical facts about Jesus? I thought it mentions the crucifixion, the Quran mentions it, but that's a different topic for a different day. So it's not just paper and ink. It tells you how successful and rich a society were. Because if Brother Abdullah here is able to kill 30 sheep so that he can copy a mushaf, that meat has to be paid for. That food has to go to someone. He has to pay a specialist to prepare that skin. Not only that, he has to find a scribe, a copyist, who will not only make sure they write the words correctly, but that they're authorized in the first place to write the Quran because the Quran mentions only the pure come near it. 
Some of the scholars say that you have to do wudu before you touch the Quran. Without non-Muslims in general, should not touch the Arabic Quran. But the majority of the copyists describes are Christians. So think about this. Why would Christian scribes copy a Quran which speaks of Isa alayhi salam not being a god more accurately than the Bible? Why would they do that? Can anyone give a reason why? Anyone at all? Their own beliefs? No, or to refute the Quran? Bad, yeah. Okay, that's a good possibility. But the thing is, they were terrible at that. Uh, I'll come to that. So the Christians, for about a period of six to seven hundred years, they specialized in writing the Quran. And they transmitted it accurately. accurately. The difference is in the Christian faith, the early Christians never quoted the Bible word for word they always paraphrased it. So you can go and look at the writings of the church fathers before around the year 400. You will never find them quote any verse of the Bible accurately, except for one. It's the Shema Yisrael in the Hebrew Bible. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, it's the Old Testament. It's about three passages. Jews they pay people to inscribe these words on boxes that they attach to their upper left arm and they have to recite these three verses once every morning and once every evening. This is the only passage they ever quote word for word. But would you not be surprised to think that Jesus in the New Testament, when he quotes it, he gets it wrong? Isn't that strange? Has anyone ever heard that before? That's the Jewish version of the Shahada. He quotes it twice, I think in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And he gets it wrong twice. So I've asked Christians, why did he get it wrong? And the response is, it's not that he got it wrong, it's that the Gospel authors made a mistake. If it's not the Gospel authors making a mistake, it's that the Jews corrupted it in the Hebrew Bible, and now Jesus is correcting it then. But the thing is, if for a couple hundred years, you recite something twice a day, every day for your life, as a community, you write it down, you would think for God's sake you would be able to preserve it. It will kind of be like I come up here and I get the, the basmala wrong. Right? I say bismillah, hirrahim, ar-Rahman or something. But did I get that wrong? Not sure. Right? That's the equivalent of it. And that's what happened. And we'll come to that inshallah. So it's not just paper and ink. It tells you about the knowledge of the people, how sacred they perceived the scripture to be, how pious they were, how wealthy they were, what their purposes in copying these things were. We can tell that if a scribe is writing at a sharp angle, that they're likely writing as someone is speaking. We can tell when someone is copying from one book into another based on where they skip with their eye. We call it parablepsis. This is how detailed the sciences are. So both the Christians and the Muslims, we develop the science. Does anyone know what the Muslim equivalent to textual criticism is? Okay. I'm guessing, is it Jarh wa Ah, No, no, no. Terrible at this. The Muslim equivalent to textual criticism, where scholars look at the writing in a physical paper and they try to determine what the correct writing actually is to remove any errors from it. Well, okay, so it's an obvious one. Ilm al Rasim al Mushaf, the science of the writing of the Quran, basically. <laughs> right? That's an easy one, easy one. So, us Muslims, we developed a way where we would write it letter for letter and account for it. The Jews did something similar, but they did it much later. In our Asanid, can you have an unknown person in the chain of the Quran? No. no. Can you have a, a, a gap in that chain for the Quran, the transmission of the Quran? No. So the Jews also have Asanid, but they have rabbis who are unknown, who lived for hundreds of years. And then those rabbis who have no names or no identities, who are anonymous, who lived for hundreds of years, had children who, as you would guess it, were equally having no name and also lived for hundreds of years. 
So I sat down with my Jewish friends and I said, this is a little bit suspicious, don't you think? All these gaps, you, can you give me a little bit of the biography of one of these rabbis? No, they were none of us. Well, how do you know they transmitted the thing correctly if they were none of us? You can't criticize them. You can't judge them. You don't know who they are, what their motivations were. SubhanAllah. So this is where we stand out. We don't hold the same reverence for it as they do, but we manage to preserve it. Why is that? I think it's because of Allah's promise. For the Christians and the academics, they say, for some unknown reason, I will come to this. They say repeatedly, we cannot account for why the Muslim Asanid, our chains of transmission, were not contaminated, meaning that we didn't try to fix it along the way and change things. We didn't fabricate the chains. They say no contamination. So I'm going to put forward a simple idea because I don't want to get involved in textual criticism tonight. Some of you might fall asleep like my uncle Sadat there. I'm going to put forward a simple proposition that if God gives you scripture, he gives you revelation, then we have to agree on these four things. That he's sending a specific message. Agree? Right? What is the point that God sends you a message and it's not specific? Like he just sends you the alphabet. Would that, be, would that teach you anything? No. He has to send it in a specific way, meaning that the words are in a certain order to convey a certain meaning. Do you agree to that? Yeah. Right? With a specific meaning. So God will not send us a message for us to act upon, to learn from, to benefit from, but we can't make sense of it. And it must be for a specific purpose. So now we know that the Quran is for healing. We know that it's uh, didactic. It's meant to teach us things. It's no ethic. It's meant to make us uh, intellectual. It's meant to help, help us lead society. So I will argue that the logic of scripture tonight, when applied to the Quran, it's valid. Would you guys agree to that? Wrong. You're supposed to challenge me. That was the second slide. <laughs> You're supposed to say no. So I'm going to say on a very simple basis that the logic of scripture is valid for Islam and invalid for any other religion, including Christianity. And if you disagree, like I said, it's a conversation. I will happily hand the mic over five minutes. You give me your response. That's my promise. Now, Brother Abdullah didn't know I was going to do that, so it's also his promise now too, I suppose. So tell me if this is right or wrong. For Christians, the primary source of knowledge about Jesus is the Bible. Am I correct here? Where else would a Christian learn about Jesus? They'll go to church. But where, where does the pastor read from? The Bible. For the Muslim, the primary source of knowledge about Allah is the Quran. Is that fair as well? So wouldn't it be sensible if from the start of your religion, scripture was intended to be there and that it was not an afterthought. So the Orientalists have two ideas when it comes to Christianity and Islam. They argue that the Quran in some form was developed 100, 150 years after the Prophet Sallallahu to unite the Arabs and to give them a purpose for which to fight and build an empire. Okay, that's logical from their perspective. They don't hold that opinion anymore because we have manuscripts of the Quran within the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So they can't make that claim anymore. But if you look at the religion of Islam, would you agree with me that the Quran plays a central role in the life of the Muslim? Would you agree to that? Well, if anyone is a Christian, you were a Christian. I, a Christian, going to be a Christian, Allah forbid. Is the Bible a center of life for you as a Christian? The answer would be no. You might read it, you might hear about it at the church, but how much do you study the Gospels themselves? Are you commanded to read them every day? Do you preserve any of them? Do you try to memorize them? The only part of the Bible that most Christians have ever tried to memorize are the Psalms of David, because they're meant to be lyrical, like songs, like poems, so they're easier to memorize and understand. But when we compare the Quran and the Bible, we come to see that the Quran at the start of its revelation was intended to be a scripture for its community. It cannot have been an afterthought. So we ask another question to make sense of this. 
Did the first community of Christians have a complete Bible? Does anyone know? You want to give it a go? That's probably a good answer. So for the Christians, they had the Old Testament. They were originally considered Jews. Jews who happened to believe in a Messiah, who is Jesus. Now, for the Christians, they have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's meant to be the life story and the teachings of Jesus. It's meant to be from early Christians, but it's the consensus today that it's not. Okay? And we're going to come to that, inshallah. But the point being... If Isa alayhi salam came with a message, wouldn't it have been a scripture to his people? It would not have been an afterthought, someone some decades later, you write about it. It would have been at that point and time, write down what I say and transmit it authentically. Because that's what the... If you read the New Testament, you will see Jesus complain about two people repeatedly. The Pharisees, a particular class of Jews, and the scribes, the people who write the law or the Torah. He repeatedly criticizes them. Ask any Christian, why does he criticize the scribes in particular? Why would you criticize the people who copy scripture if they were doing nothing wrong and they were innocent? It's kind of an obvious question. On the other hand, did the Muslims, the first Muslims, the first generation of Muslims, did they have a complete you know, recitation or copy of the Quran? Can we say that they had that? Did they lose any part of it in that early time? No, they didn't. So at this start, there was no capacity for losing it. Now we ask another question. <laughs> Did the first community of Christians need to use the Bible in their daily lives? How many Muslims here know that Christians pray five times a day? Ooh. I'm seeing some confused faces here. It's called the liturgy of the hours. Yes, they pray five times a day. If you're a Roman Catholic, they pray five times a day. I've happened to go to their Maghreb prayer accidentally a couple of times. <laughs> right. so, so the thing is, they don't have to use scripture when they pray. They don't have to. It's up to the priest at the church to decide what's going to be read that day and why. They, typically, there's a calendar that the, the Vatican sets which they have to follow. But they're not doing in-depth studies like we do, right? On the other hand, is it possible for a Muslim to live their daily life as a faithful believer and not use any part of the Quran? Yes or no? No. Why not? You have to pray Salah, right? So whoever said yes, we need to have a conversation afterwards. Ah, challenge. I had a question for you, so yes. um, the first community are you referring to the people who at the time of Jesus, yeah. Why would they not need to use the teachings of Jesus at that time? So I put script, would they need to use the Bible every day of their lives? So it's our argument that they should have. But they say that they didn't. And we're going to come to why they say that, right? Uh, we'll come to that, inshallah, but I hope I've answered the question in a small way. But are you, when, you, when you say Bible and you talk about Jesus specifically, are you talking about the teachings that are written in the Bible itself, or...? The Bible that they say that they've written and preserved, that one. No, so I'm talking about at the time of Jesus, because there had to have been some sort of claim, Yes, right? there should have been. There should have been, right? But there so wasn't. There's, you're claiming that there, there is no... There is no... There, so, there's not preserved. So what the, what the uh, scholars and historians say is that about the life of Jesus, everything we have is around after the year 70. So Jesus lived up until the year 33, 35 CE. That's 2,000 years ago. And 40 years after that was the great Jewish revolt where Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And at that point, that's when the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, began to be written and circulated. Sometime 150 years after that, around the year 130 to the year 185, the stories began to solidify, they became popular, and what has survived is something maybe from that time period. That's what the scholars say. So what Christians consider to be the gospels we don't consider it to be the angel whatsoever. We don't and we can't. And how we know this is the Quran, I think in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, 
It tells us to use the Quran as a muhaymin, as a guardian, a filter, something to judge anything else by, to see if it's revelation in meaning, maybe not in wording. And as a consequence of that, we have to dismiss most of the Gospels. But we'll come to that, inshallah. So a Muslim can't live his daily life without using the Quran. We agree on this. The Christians agree as well. Yes. So the, for, I'm assuming though, like the, people, the Christians at the time of Jesus, they some, in some capacity used the teachings of Jesus in their daily life, no? This is what we would like to assume. But what would his teachings have been like? The Quran mentions that he, some of the laws were abrogated at the time of Isa alayhi salam for his people. We know historically that they did that. There's one chapter, I think it's Matthew chapter 5, where he changes three laws. Just three laws. Other than that, um, they taught at that time they did not need to follow the law that was given previously. That's what the Christians say. So they had nothing to practice on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of a law like we Muslims would follow. So what was the point of Jesus coming that, that That's what we asked them. That's the, that's the point of the presentation, mashallah. The brother got it before I did. So what I argue and what historians argue as well is we have to know that the Quran is very early and that the Quran could not have been an afterthought or later development, nor could it have been developed by different communities over a different period of time. There's a science called stematology. Keyword there is stem. If you look at the root of a plant, it's just like that. If you study computer science, it's like a binary tree. What we look at is to see what the grandfather text is, what the children text are, what the parent text is, the sibling text, etc. We use the same terms. So we draw a genealogical or a family tree of the manuscripts of the Quran. And they all come back to one point, the early 7th century CE. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived between the year 570 and 632 CE. Our manuscripts, in the form that we have them today, use a form of writing in lettering and size that go back to that point in time. How do we know this? There is uh, the Birmingham manuscript, Arabica Mengana 15728. That could be within the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or his companions, one of the two. We have another one, uh, Palestino Petropolitanus, that contains a lot of the Quran. We have another one, Qaf 47, that contains a lot of the Quran as well. We have a uh, top copy, Surai Medina 1A, that contains more than 90% of the Quran. And just top copy, the top copy manuscript, that contains 97% of the Quran. We put all of them together, within 100 years of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we can account word for word, letter for letter, we normally don't say that these days, but we can now, letter for letter, the transmission of the Quran is almost exactly the same with one difference. Uh, it's the Aleph, whether you lengthen it or you don't need to lengthen it, sometimes they include it. I think we call it the Daga Aleph, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right or wrong? Oh, it is, no. The Daga Aleph. So remember I told you about the missionary who studied for 23 years and eventually got his uh, PhD thesis about a missionary who went to India. I read his 400-page thesis and he kept complaining about the changes to the Quran. So me, I sit down. I want to see what changes he's talking about. So I think he came up with 1,700 changes. And it's about the vowel. Whether you lengthen the A or not, it's optional. You don't even need it. It doesn't even change the meaning if I had to fault it. So, but he went in front of a Christian audience. The Quran has been changed 1,700 times. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that the Quran was changed in 1924. You ever heard that one? That's cheating. You do polemics. Anyone else? Right. So the missionaries online, they will tell you in 1924, uh, in Egypt, in Cairo, they changed the Quran to a new edition. If this is the first time you're hearing this, Wallahi, I'm being serious. Am I right, Brother Sada? Right? They tell us this. So what I like to do is, I wait patiently, I let them repeat this claim, and then I ask them, can you show me one change that was made? And I just wait for it. 
not once has a single one of them shown me what the change was. Now, technically there was a change. The Ottomans would write the Aleph, which is written but not pronounced, in the latter red. And the Egyptians were like, this is kind of confusing. Can we just, we don't even say it. Can we just remove the red letter? Yeah, that was it, an optional letter. It's like if I come to you and I say, let's remove the numbering from pages. Does that mean I've changed the Quran? But they go on about a 1924 edition that was new. So can you imagine the Muslims come for Hajj in 1923? And in 1924, all right boys, new Quran, gonna start over again. We have not agreed on so many things for 1400 years. Do you think someone changing the Quran, the uncle in the back in Gujarat is not gonna have a problem with it? <laughs> think about this, right? So I'm looking for the seriousness from them and I don't get it. In any case, I'm just putting here, it's impossible that the Quran could have become an afterthought because of this one scenario. The companions spread out with the Quran. We assume that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam transmitted the Quran to his companions. We assume this for the sake of the arguments. They go out into the world. Now, they go to India, let's say, in a small village. Who is going to know what they teach there? Am I correct? They go to another village in the South Africa, let's say. Who is going to know what they teach there? This is 1400 years ago. I mean, for goodness sake, you guys live in Guelph, I'm from Toronto. I didn't even know what you guys do here. This is in the 21st century, that's 1400 years ago. So think about this. How would the, the, the Muslims control what someone in South Africa and someone in India is reciting as the Quran? How would they control it? What would be the mechanism? But when we look at the Masahif, the manuscripts of the Quran, we overlap them. And there is something called stichometry from the Greek words tekoi. And you basically, when you write a manuscript, you count how many letters per line and how many lines per page you will typically write. So this is how you come up with the number of letters in the Quran, right? The number of it. So you do stichometry of the Quran to the manuscripts from the 7th century CE to the ones around the 15th to 16th century they overlap 100%. So now the question becomes, why didn't those people in Africa or those people in India change it? What controlled it? And we do find manuscripts with mistakes. We do find them. But the thing is, interestingly, we don't find a group that forms out of that specific changed recitation that no one else knows about. We don't find a unique Quran from South Africa that they only recite that no one else knew about. We don't find that. And what we find after recitations is that they all adhere to the Osmanic form of writing, the Osmanic orthography. Which means, technically, all of the Masahif, for some reason or the other, I say it's by the will of Allah, and He has allowed us this mercy, we've managed to preserve it. Now, if you've not heard the term Osmanic Rasam, the other term that they use in academia is CST, consonantal skeletal text. So forget the vowels, just the consonants. We count them letter by letter and they overlap. We can account for them. Had it been the case that a particular group didn't like, and I think I bring this up later on, uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the Huruf al muqattaat Who's familiar with them? That's she, okay. Technically, everyone should be familiar with it. Alif la mim ring a bell anyone? Yeah. Right, yeah. right. The disjointed letters, basically what it is. Now I'll come to it, but just think about this for a moment. If you don't know what those letters mean, why are you still copying it down? Why don't you assume it's an error? Why don't you uh, why don't you omit it? We notice that scribes, copiers, throughout the centuries, if they don't understand something being written, they do one of two things. They omit it or they change it to make sense. Why didn't they do that to the Huruf al muqattaat They had all the opportunity to do so, and they didn't. Why not? And how can non-Muslims account for it? So in any case, we know with certainty that because the Quran is so involved in the life of a Muslim, the Muslim could not have created the Quran after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And had a Muslim chosen to do that, 
we look at the uh, Mutazilites, right? The Quran is created. They don't like the attributes of Allah. Just think about this for a moment. Uh, in that period when they were in control and they would beat us and in some places kill Muslims who did not believe in the creation of the Quran, did they not have the authority to change the recitation of the Quran to validate their beliefs? They had the might to do so, but they didn't. What stopped them? See, the thing is, as bad as they were, had they attempted to do that, it would have been much worse for them, to say the least. Continuing, the Quran as a scripture seems designed specifically for daily use and preservation. So I say as a Muslim, the, the author of the Quran, the author behind the mind of the Quran, that there was some forethought when it, come, when it comes to the Quran. So when Allah sends a scripture, he has to make it easy for us to understand, easy for us to transmit, easy for us to recite. Did he not accomplish that? So we look at the life of a Muslim and we compare the Quran and its use to that of any other faith. The Quran is only contains necessary information in an intelligible form. Does the Quran contain any biographies? No. No, it doesn't. Does it contain any genealogies? Lists of people's names. Yes, brother. Oh, you mean like an actual list for Yeah, yeah. Okay, but they do mention people in the past, right? Yeah, it mentions people in the past, yeah. but it doesn't give you genealogies. So there's actually a verse in the Bible in the New Testament, in one of the letters of Paul, Titus chapter 3, verse 9, that don't fall for the foolish controversies about the genealogies or the law. Now that was written because in the Gospels they give two different genealogies for Jesus, so it was controversial. So it would seem strange that God would tell people, study the genealogies, and at the same time, tell them, don't fall into controversies about them. It's very strange. It seems like a weird afterthought. In any case, we agree that the Quran only contains necessary information. It's very short when compared to the Bible. Um, it's rhythmic, allowing for easier recitation, and it's soothing. Has anyone ever heard the, the Greek Bible recited? There's a reason they don't recite it anymore. Okay, I mean that in a nice way, I promise. Okay, uh, trust me, by the way, we don't even know how ancient Greek was pronounced. We've recreated it, but we actually don't know. So we just call it a modern pronunciation. So technically, we don't know how it would have sounded at that time. Lastly, can't we agree that the Quran, in both its content and its form, it's distinctive from any other kind of media, literature, poems, etc. It's very distinctive. And so we asked the question, how could random Arabs with no training in literary sciences, in textual criticism, in papyrology, orthography, paleography, how were they able to develop an industry and a system to preserve this text? They paid for it with their lives. What we know is that the Muslims almost went bankrupt by paying Christian scribes in Egypt to hand copy as many books as they can find. That's the duty that the Muslims took up. So we should have pride and dignity in saying that we helped shape the modern world. And it's because of our funds that we managed to preserve the Bible for the Christians. Who do you think paid the Christian scribes so they had jobs? It was us. We gave them that money to copy their own scripture. So as Muslims, we shouldn't be shy and take a back foot and not be smart about the Bible and the Quran. Dive into it, be proud of your history and see what Muslims have accomplished. So on that basis, would you agree with me that the logic of scripture is valid for Islam? Would you say it's invalid for Christianity? The thing is, I messed up. That's only slide 13 of 30 and we've just gone an hour and 10 minutes. Am I wrong or right? 20, how much time do I have left? 23 minutes. 22 okay. minutes. Okay. Speed run? Okay. <laughs> so we're going to do a test case. I want you guys to read the next two verses on the screen and tell me if you notice the difference, okay? Now I color coded it, so no cheating. So I want you to imagine this. The Jews come to Jesus and they ask him as a prophet, show us a sign that you're a true prophet. So we have two Gospels on the screen, one from the Gospel of Mark, 
the other from the Gospel of Matthew. On the left hand side, Jesus responds to the Jews and says, no sign will be given to this generation. Will there be a sign given? No, none, zero. The same conversation in another person's gospel, the gospel of Matthew, in the same Bible, no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Now, if I tell you no one will be murdered, and I say no one will be murdered but Abdullah, that's a big difference. That's a huge difference, wouldn't it? Right? And the thing is, a prophet, if he gives a false prophecy, he's liable to be killed under the Jewish Sharia. Okay? So this is serious business. Jesus is either a true prophet or not. He's either given a true prophecy or not. But in the same book, either he gives a sign or he doesn't. Now, would you call this a contradiction? Okay. So the Christians came up with a couple of answers to this problem. The first is, Mark and Matthew are writing about two different events. Even if I grant that thinking, either you give a sign or you don't. If Jesus knew a sign would be given, but at one time said that none would be given, he's incorrect or misleading. Either a sign will be given or not. The law of, non -contra the law of contradiction. Either it will be given or not. On the other hand, if he's writing, if, if the author of the Gospel of Matthew adds this, then the scripture is corrupted. So they fall into a dichotomy. Either Jesus made a mistake, lied, or some ethical flaw, or someone changed the writing. Now this is a big difference, and I've never seen a Christian account for it. There is a third option. It's called the Gospel of Luke. So there are four main Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the Gospel of Luke, in the first four verses, he says that he, he checked everything from the eyewitnesses that was handed down through the generations, and he accounts carefully for everything from the first to the last. He happens to disagree with Matthew here. So that tells you within their own book, the Gospels discredit themselves. If a Gospel says others have tried but I am accounting for everything from the start to the end. What does that mean about the other Gospels? Something is wrong with them. And we happen to know what Gospels he was talking about because the author of the Gospel of Luke copies the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew in AB blocks. So in one block he'll have the paragraph from the Gospel of Mark word for word and in another the Gospel of Matthew. It's a composition. So we knew what he was discrediting. But as a Christian, you go, they go to the Bible, they read the New Testament, and you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in one book. As a Muslim, could you live with such a problem in your Quran? Would the Creator make mistakes like these? Because Allah tells us, had this Quran been from anyone but Him, you would find many contradictions within it. He tells you that. We continue. So we come to the Huruf al muqatta'at if you guys didn't know them, Alif, Lam, Mim, and Hamim. Okay? You can go to any of the Qira'at, any of the recitations of the Quran, not once do they omit any of the Huruf al muqatta'at not one half is omitted. Now, technically, there is a difference with Surat al-Baqarah, and I think the brother who was reciting earlier might know it, but I forgot his face. Damn it. Okay, anyone else? Does anyone know the difference uh, for Surah Al-Baqarah? What the difference is? Uh, the recitation of, of those three letters. There's a difference, one difference, when it comes to the recitation of the first eye of Surah Al-Baqarah. Who knows what it is? Do you also mean like the lengthening? So, between Lam and Mim, they pause. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. Technically, a scribe will omit that. We know that they omit it because when we look at the New Testament, whenever there's a verse that's controversial or problematic, they leave it out. Whenever there's something that does not make sense, they change the words. So if something is degrading to God, they will change it from their perspective. The Jews did something similar. The Jews had a, um, a committee and I forget the name of it now, just give me a moment. Uh, 
the name escapes me. But the Jews had a committee set up for about 13 to 17 places in the Hebrew Bible where when God revealed a scripture to them, he, he discredited himself or he made himself look bad. So what they would do is, and they tell you this, um, they go and they switch the words so that God is not degraded. Now that seems strange to us as Muslims, but their claim is that God gave them the authority to protect scripture. So by making sure he doesn't discredit himself, they're protecting scripture. The first question would be, why would you think God would send you scripture word for word that discredits himself? Doesn't that seem strange? So there's this, uh, I don't want to go off topic, but in the book of Job, Prophet Ayub salam, you go to the Old Testament, and in the book of Job, they call this the, 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 the changes of the scribes, uh, the name escapes me. But in the book of Job, the devil comes to God and challenges God that if you affect the life of uh, Job, or you give him the authority to do so, he will curse you to your face. And the word used here is ye barakeka, in Arabic, baraka, right? Now, does the word baraka mean blessing or curse? Blessing. So what the Jews say is that originally the word was curse, but who would want to curse God? So they changed it to blessing, but you have to interpret it as curse. I say, okay, that's strange. Because if I read that as it is, wouldn't God lose the bet every time? Because Job ends up praising him at the end of the book. So in changing that one word, they make Satan win a bet against God. Isn't that strange? Uh, I'm trying to remember the name that they call it. What's the name for scribes again? Someone remind me in Hebrew. It slips my mind, I'm becoming an old man. The point is, I can give you the reference for it, but they consider those changes to be fine because they're protecting the dignity of God. Doesn't make sense to me as a Muslim. I've never gotten an answer about that Job thing. When it comes to the number of manuscripts of the Quran versus the New Testament, this is the difference we're looking at. The Quran is on the blue side, the New Testament is on the pink side. There are about 28,000 New Testament manuscripts. Greek, Hebrew, Latin for the New Testament, what Christians call the Injil. For the Quran, we have today, and this number, by the way, I think it's inaccurate. There are two people, one in particular, uh, Professor George Alain, at the Top Copy Museum in Istanbul. We know that there were manuscripts there that we have the rough number of, but we haven't, uh, what's the word, we haven't processed them. One, we don't have enough people to do it, and two, it's a very tedious and difficult job. It's likely that we have other manuscripts like the Birmingham manuscript present in that collection. We know that, we just have to find someone or people with funding that will help us process it. But with the rough figure as it stands today, we have over 250,000 handwritten manuscripts of the Quran. I want you to understand this. The power of Rome and Christianity could only give you 28,000. The power of some Arabs without a dynasty and without you know, an empire, 250,000. How do you think we achieve that? We have to say Alhamdulillah for these types of things. Yes? So what, what's the spectrum of the, like, the dates for these uh, Up until the medieval, end of the medieval era, I think 13, 14th century CE. So it's a long time. The thing is, some Christians will come and say to me, oh, well, that's because the early manuscripts of the Bible were burnt by the, the pagan Romans. It's possible, but weren't Muslims persecuted too? Weren't, weren't our villages attacked and our people killed? What happened in Jerusalem, Constantinople? What happened in these places? It was not fun and games. So that's not a valid criticism. And in fact, there's a brilliant book by a professor, uh, Candida Moss, out of the University of Birmingham, I think it's called the, uh, the Myth of Persecution. She goes through the data about Roman persecution of early Christians and she says a very minimal amount. We're going to do another test case because we're short of time. My brother Abdullah is shaken. <laughs> I caught him. 
John 3, 16. Let me know if you know this verse. For in this way God loved the world so that he gave his one and only son in order that everyone who believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Have you heard that one? Okay. Just raise your hand if you've heard it. Okay. So the thing is, this is in John chapter 3. And Jesus is speaking to what we would call a, a Jewish theologian at that time. Right? And Jesus is speaking with this guy. And in this chapter, they're having an intimate conversation about their beliefs and what Jesus believes. Or what Jesus is teaching. And then we come to verse 16. Many Christians, if you go to their red letter Bibles, the places where they think Jesus spoke, they put them in red letters. Sometimes they have this in red. And sometimes they don't. Because this, according to most academics, is a parenthetical taught by one of the scribes at some point in time. This was not originally part of the Gospel of John. So one of the most famous verses about Christianity is not meant to be original to the text itself. What makes it worse is, if you look on the right hand side, I ask who speaks these words. Some Christians will say Jesus, some would say John. And I ask them, how do you know that? That's when the conversation ends. Second, I ask them, what are the required beliefs for salvation? Because this says, whoever believes in him. Raise your hand if you believe in Jesus as a Muslim. Technically, that should be everyone. I'm ashamed of you. Okay. If you believe in Jesus, you will have eternal life. Does it say what you have to believe in him about? No. Who tells you what these beliefs are meant to be? You can read the entirety of the book of John, the Gospel of John. You will find very few places where Jesus commands people to believe and what to believe about their beliefs. Lastly, the question here I put is, one and only or only begotten son. Typically in this verse, the word would be begotten. So some of you might have missed that word, wondering where it went. Christians today, in looking back at the Greek language, have come to realize that the word for begotten, monogenes, was wrongly translated or wrongly used. I know that sounds strange. It took them a couple centuries, but it changed from the Latin into the Council of Nicaea's text in the, in the year 325, from the word unicus, unique, to the word unigenitus, uh, only begotten. That got converted into the Greek and that became adopted. In our modern day, they now have the ability to go back and examine the text, and they've come to realize the word there can't be begotten. So if you go to any Christian, you ask them, do you believe that Jesus, who is God, is begotten, created, made, but the word begotten, they will say yes. Take them to a modern version of the Bible, to John 3.16, and ask them where begotten is. They can't find it there. And what they will typically say is that these new versions are liberal and you can't trust them. No, the new versions are more accurately based on the earlier Greek because they're restoring the text. Now, you can be a, a Christian who believes that God is four in one, five in one, three in one. This verse does not affect your beliefs, right? So wouldn't it be helpful if Matthew, Mark, Luke and John explained what they wrote? Can you imagine having the Quran and not having the tafsir of the companions? Would that make sense? The tafsir from the companions. So would you believe me if I told you for the four gospels, there is not a single recorded word in history where any of the four authors explains a single word in any of the four gospels. You will never find them say, and Matthew said, explaining his verses, or John said, explaining his verses. How is that? You will find them saying the church fathers said, but you go to the church fathers and read what they wrote. They don't mention Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John teaching them these things. So how would you know what God intended or meant by these words if you don't get it from the primary author he gave it to? You make it up as you go along. What time is it? Can someone remind me? 7.23. 7.23. Yeah. Seven minutes left. Okay, speed run. So historically, there were four canonical Gospels, meaning authoritative Gospels, what they considered to be part of Scripture. That's the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Simple point I just mentioned, we've never seen where those four authors commented on their own writings. That's a historical anomaly. 
it's impossible that someone has revealed scripture and they don't explain what it means. If you have two Christians in a room and you show them that one verse, John 3, 16, I promise you could come away with two different interpretations. So how is it possible that God would give them scripture but not give them an understanding of it? That does not make sense. Scripture is meant to teach, inform, and guide. If it does not, can it be called scripture? No. We continue. Everyone should know Surah Al-Ikhlas. Who speaks these words? Who are these words from? Is there any debate about this? No. What are the beliefs required for salvation? In those four ayat. That Allah is absolutely one. He's not like Lego pieces that you put together. That he has no needs. We don't have to feed him, do we? He never had offspring, nor was he created, or nor does he, was he himself created. Is he created? No, done. And there is none comparable to him. Is that simple to understand? Is that easy to transmit? Is that easy to recite in the Arabic? So think about this. The majority of questions a Muslim can have about who God is can technically be answered by these four ayat. I think some of the uh, scholars, they write, whatever conception you have of God, that's not God. If you picture a form of God in your mind, you can't actually put a shape to God, right? He's eternally uncreated. But if you're a Christian, can you give me four verses in the entire Bible? whether it's 66 books or 73 that give you something comparable to this that explains who God is what his attributes are and how he's meant to be understood what's the equivalent to this they don't have one now wouldn't a God who wants you to know him tell you who he is in a simple reasonable way and he does so we have a blessing when it comes to the Quran I wanted to take a longer test case, we don't have the time, but this is the Gospel of Luke, chapter verses 1 to 4. He says here that he wanted to compile an account, the word here is narrative in the Greek, of the things that has been fulfilled among us, like the accounts passed on to us by those who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word from the beginning. So it seemed good to me, not that he was inspired by God, not that he was told by an authoritative teacher, it just seemed good to him. Because I have followed all things carefully from the beginning to write an orderly account for you and his friend is Theophilus, so that you may know for certain the things that you were thought. Now, if this book is meant to be accurate and accounts for everything carefully, anything which contradicts it would be wrong. Am I correct? So the thing is, you go to Christians and you ask them to read Mark, Matthew, and then to read the Gospel of Luke, there were stark contradictions. The only places that Christians believe Jesus claimed to be God primarily are in the Gospel of John. And of the I am sayings, I am before Abraham was I am, they claim that's Jesus claiming to be God. Those passages, about six of them, are not found in the Gospel of Luke. So if this guy accounted for everything from eyewitnesses, and those passages aren't there, then either those passages are false or this guy is lying. It can't be the case that there's a third scenario. Am I correct? By the way, this is basic logic, the law of the excluded middle. Either a proposition is true or false, there's no third option. Were yes. these four at the same time or who came first and uh, where? This is the problem. Today, Christians believe that the Gospel of Mark was written, then the Gospel of Matthew borrows from Mark, then Luke borrows from Mark and Matthew, and then the Gospel of John. But early Christians, one in particular, they only depend on one person. His name is Papias. He wrote around the year 100 to the year 120. So it's a long period of time. Sorry, 90 to 120. So about 30 years. He says that Mark wrote an account, but it was unordered. Well, if Mark wrote an account which was in the wrong order, did God inspire him to write it incorrectly? And when we compare the Gospel of Mark today, it's in order with the other Gospels. So then the Gospel of Mark he's speaking about either no longer exists or is not the same. He says that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew, but the Gospel of Matthew was originally compiled in the Greek language, Koine Greek. We know not with certainty. And then that Greek was later translated into Hebrew. So this guy is an unreliable witness. In fact, uh, 
a church historian in the fourth century, Eusebius, in his book, Church History, he says that uh, Papias, as a witness, was a simple-minded individual who easily, easily believed in mystical things. Now, the brother mentioned Jawa Tadil earlier, Hadith criticism, you raise a person and you lower them, right? So they criticize this guy, say that he believes in weird things, and then he tells us why church history validates him. He says because of the age of the man, meaning how early he goes back in history. That's the only reason. Can you believe that? We depend on one narration from one person who we know is intellectually limited and gets things wrong, and who believes in things which they consider to be heretical today. Yes? So Papias, this guy, he's, yeah. the, he's the primary source for yes. all of the four Gospels? No, for the names of at least three of them, okay. for three of the authors. The first one, mystical and simple-minded. Now, if we call someone in a Hadith narration in the chain simple-minded, it's usually not a, a good thing, right? Now, I wanted to go through this really quickly, but I'll just summarize it. This link, this page, you go read it. I'm just gonna click it quickly. I know we're short on time, just forgive me. I just wanna click it Thank so you know I'm not making it up. No internet, but bro, I got you. I loaded it before I came, okay? It's not a Muslim website, it's a Christian website, newadvent.org, technically Catholic. Anyone can get this book. It's the commentary on the Gospel of John. Uh, he mentions here the discrepancy between scripture here. He mentions what you're meant to think about it. And then he mentions here that scripture contains many contradictions and many statements which are literally not true, but must be read spiritually and mystical. He says, in the case I have supposed, where the historians desire to teach us by an image what they have seen in their mind, their meaning would be found if the four were wise to exhibit no disagreements. And we must understand that with the four evangelists, it is not otherwise. They made full use for their purpose of things done by Jesus in the exercise of his wonderful and extraordinary power, they use in the same way his sayings, and in some places, they tack on to their writing with language apparently implying things of sense, things made manifest to them in a purely intellectual way, meaning they added things on where they saw that it saw fit. He continues, I do not condemn them if they even sometimes dealt freely with things which to the eye of history happened differently and changed them so as to subserve the mystical aims they had in view. Uh, lost myself here. So as to speak of a thing which happened in a certain place as if it happened in another or of what took place at a certain time as if it had taken place at another time and to introduce into what was spoken in a certain way some changes of their own. They proposed to speak the truth where it was possible, both materially and spiritually, and where this was not possible, it was their intention to prefer the spiritual to the material. The spiritual truth was often preserved, as one might say, in the material falsehood. Now, if a Muslim said this about the Quran, is he a believer or a disbeliever? <laughs> if a Christian says this about the Bible, is he a believer or a disbeliever? He's an Orthodox Christian. Yeah, Orthodox Christian. So I wanted to continue, but I think we're short of time. So, okay. so other scholars have noted this. Dr. Brent Nongbe, I mentioned him earlier. Um, uh, he mentions and he quotes this, the material truth, sorry, the spiritual truth and the material falsehood meaning they wrote lies to convey the truth. So they call it material falsehood. Um, the Christians, when they have to reconstruct the New Testament, they used to have this letter system, A, B, C, and D. And for the variants in the New Testament, they, they would look at the manuscripts and they will try to restore what the original words were. So when they did that restoration for each change that they have decided deserves to go into the Bible, they give it a rating. So A means that they were certain about it. Anything other than A, they're not certain about. So B, C, and D, let's add them up. If you're only certain about 8.7% of your scripture, then you are uncertain about the rest of it. Am I correct here? Or am I wrong? 
right? So the letter B indicates that the text is almost certain. Do we believe in the Quran almost certainly or certainly? The letter C indicates that the committee had difficulty in deciding which variant to place in the text. The letter D indicates that the committee had great difficulty in arriving at a decision. So can you imagine, you sit down to recite your scripture, read from it, and the person who compiled it says, I'm not certain that those words are meant to go there. So let's add them up, B, C, and D. What's 32% at 48? I'm not good at math, so I need some help. 80%? Okay. Add 10%? 90%. So can you be 90% less certain about the Quran? Now, it would be one thing if I made up these numbers, but I didn't. So in the late 1990s, they stopped using the letter system. There's a reason why that is. We're not going to get into that. But this is the last published rating that we had. UBS 3, we're not UBS 5, the 5th edition. And its comparative equivalent is the 28th edition uh, Nestle Allen text. So 28 editions of the New Testament. These ratings, go show them to Christians. When Do you have this for the Quran? Can we have this for the Quran? No. Uh, I just wanted to go through quickly one of the Asanid. Can anyone know, can anyone read this? Can you guys see this? Yep. Where just now is this from? That's cheating. He knows Arabic. Anyone else? Anyone? It's at the very top. It tells you who the Imam is. Huh? Imam Asim. Imam Asim, correct. Who is in uh, row A? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Jibreel alayhi salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't know if you guys can see this. In the, in the, I can stand up, I'm not an old man. Whose name is mentioned here? Can anyone tell me? His name is mentioned here. Yeah. Yeah. Is that an important guy? Is he? Very important, right? Compile the Quran twice. Ooh, <coughs> this is a trick one. Who's this one? Again, he's again twice because they had some of the same students later on. So they had some of the same students that they taught. So the thing is, the Quran by definition has to be tawatur, it has to be mass transmitted. The thing is, none of these people had the permission to recite unless they were authenticated by their teachers. And these are the asanid and we have them for all of the recitations. This is the most popular one that we use today, but it doesn't have to be the only one. So the thing is, I have like a 600 page book that has all of these asanid and they go through them in detail. So the thing is, I often ask Christians, can you give me this for your scripture, the Old or the New Testament? The answer is typically no. If it's a Jewish guy, then it's an anonymous rabbi who lived for a few hundred years, but different topic. So here's what we can conclude. This was not meant to be a class or a lecture, and I hope it was interesting, or at least it would provoke you to think about the Quran a bit more. But here are the two conclusions we can come to. Historically, the Quran can be traced century by century in complete manuscript form, we're ignoring the oral tradition, containing 100% of the written text from the early 7th century CE or 1st century of the Hijra, around the year 622 CE. Historically, we cannot trace any of the New Testament writings to the 1st century CE, 2000 years ago, in complete or partial manuscript form until the 4th century CE. In fact, the vast majority of the New Testament in its written form comes three to 400 years after the time of Jesus. It's called the Uncial Manuscripts. Um, so the fourth century, but the version that the Christians have today is not based on those fourth century manuscripts only. It includes variants from the 9th, 10th, and 11th century CE. And where they cannot find proper wording from their own thinking, they create their own wording and they insert it into the text, right? It's called, a, um, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, an emendation, a change to improve. Now, they don't have any manuscript basis for it, but if they think the author meant something, 
but made a grammatical error or there's a copyist error, they will insert their own writing and they call it a conjectural amendation. Conjecture without proof, amendation change to improve. We can never do that to the Quran. And we see evidence of this with the Huruf al muqatta'at We don't know what the disjoint letters mean, but by Allah we keep it in there, one way or the other. If it was a Christian, they would have omitted it at some point. So Jazakum Lil Khairan, I appreciate the, the invitation and I hope you guys learned something. If I have to take you back to anything, it's this. Challenge and doubt everything I said. I put references at the bottom of the screen. I'll give Brother Abdullah the slides. And so if I got something wrong, promise me, make a YouTube video.